No. Okay, I'm going to talk about Iran this morning or wherever you are in the world because there are a few people who are listening from other parts of the world. And the question is, who am I? Why should I talk about Iran? You know, you know, how do you know I'm just not off the street? And um, a few things. Uh, am I, what? I'll ignore you. <laughs> if this lady is your wife, you're going to pay for that. <laughs> Here's the, the reason why. I, um, I'm 72, and when I was 28, I studied in the university in Iran, not in Tehran, in northeastern Iran. Uh, the language of instruction was Persian. That's the national language of Iran. And uh, um, my background is I have a PhD in Islamic studies. Well, why was I going to the university in Iran? I, I was uh, putting off getting my PhD, which was at Columbia. And I was looking for every excuse to find interesting things to do because if I got a PhD and I have to get a job and grow up and I didn't want to do that. But seriously, I had been in Iran the year before as well. And um, uh, I, at the time, I have, I would say, a passive knowledge of Persian. Now. Uh, I was pretty good back then. It would take me about two weeks to, to, to get into it. Why was I there? I wanted desperately to find a way to, to make peace between the Muslim and the Jew. I'm a Jew, I'm American, and I care passionately about the state of Israel. And uh, I spent most of my 20s, actually in my late teens, traveling around the Muslim world Living a Muslim life, I once could dive in better as a Muslim than as a Jew, both as a Shiite and a Sunni. Now, why do I say that? Because Shiites and Sunnis accept a few things in common. Their God they call Allah. The Prophet is Muhammad, but they don't see him the same. They accept the Quran, and that's where they part ways. They're basically almost separate religions. That's heresy, what I just said. Um, if, uh, from their point of view. And uh, I had spent all this time in the Sunni world and I decided I needed to spend some time in Iran. And some of my closest friends, I know that's a cliche, were Iranians growing up. And I learned a lot. Uh, my, one of my closest friends in the world used to be married to an Iranian Jew. And uh, I just wanted to understand this because I was desperately, and I mean desperately, looking for a way that we could have peace, as I understand that word, which means bygones be bygones, we're all friends, let's get along, and let's work together. By the age of 28, I had realized that there is no concept in Islam of bygones be bygones. Salam does not mean peace. It sounds like shalom, and linguistically, it's the, the same root and same everything. But meanings, words diverge in different dialects in English. For example, where I grew up, that's bad, means it's good. <laughs> so just because there are certain other dialects in the United States, if someone said, oh, that's really bad, you're going to understand it to mean it's not a good thing. But language diverses, and just because the words sound the same, like shalom and salam, doesn't mean they have the same. Salam means the joy that one gets by submitting to Allah's will through Islam. Islam itself means submission. But I, I digress, because I really should concentrate and expect to concentrate today only on Iran. What year was that that you were there? 1978. It was, it was right before the Shah. Very good. Right before the Shah left. But please understand, the revolution is not a day. It's a process. When revolutions take place, it's maybe an event which push, sends it over the top. 
But what was happening, I lived through the beginning and stages of the revolution. I'm going to talk about that in some of the examples of, that I hope to give. Because it's an insight into the Iranian mindset. And what I'd really like you to take away, if I succeed here today, I want you to understand how Iran's, Iranians think about the world. And I tell you, it's completely, not completely, it's 90 some odd percent different, uh, differently from what the way we do. And why it is essential that people working on the Iranian issue understand it. And the saddest thing I want to say is the United States government, where I, wor I worked in the Pentagon for 28 years on Islamic culture. And the saddest thing is that we have the ability to understand this, but we refuse to. Now, I have here, let's say it's not mine, this I'm holding up for those of you on Zoom, a, a, a plastic bottle with a clear liquid inside. Now, I'm thirsty, and if I decide this is water, <coughs> But you, Norman, know that it is not. And you're saying, Harold, no, don't touch it. Don't drink it. You may be thirsty because you will die. Mm -hmm. And I say, it looks like water to me. It's in a Costco bottle. It has to be water. And you basically beg me, please don't do this. You will die. And I refuse to listen to you. You know, because you brought the bottle in. I refuse to listen to you. I'm thirsty. I drink it and I die. I want to tell you that those negotiating uh, with Iran already in the time of Obama, but even before, and definitely the people to, to, who are doing the, uh, it's not negotiating, it's called submitting to Iran, they are, uh, what they're doing is they're refusing to see the truth and they are being taken advantage of. And we in the United States and our European allies are being, let's say being had royally. You can understand the word had for what I, uh, I really shouldn't be saying, certainly in a shul, and, uh, but you know exactly what I mean. We are choosing not to know. We are choosing to, uh, to, uh, to ignore and we are, what is happening is Iran, if things continue as they are, will have shortly a nu nuclear capability. Does Iran need a nuclear capability? It has about on gas on on uh, oil reserves. Maybe it's the second or third largest, certainly in the Middle East, um, resources. And gas, it has twenty percent of the natural gas of the entire world. So what does it need nuclear power for? Oh uh, well, we have the right to. Well, I'm tell you any nation which is ruled, which, which, which shall we say the government is democratic, where it supposedly answers to the people. Every nation who has nuclear weapons like that not, doesn't do anything. They don't use nuclear weapons. Uh, the, uh, but when a, t a tyrant use, has nuclear weapons, when it's a top-down society, the people, that's where the danger is. That's why it is, it's not dangerous that Iran have nuclear weapons. It's dangerous that this government of Iran, which is totalitarian, which in Islam, it wants to take over first the Muslim world and then the entire world. Read its constitution. Its constitution is based on the Quran. And it basically said the goal, there's no such thing as I said, the Salam means this joy that doesn't have anything to do with peace. Eventually, it's going to take over the entire world, and we were all are going, we are all going to become Muslim. Now, you and I may have different views on that, but they know that it's eventually going to happen. And in Iran, 
unlike the United States, unlike the West, where we're obsessed with time, we want it now. That's what Amazon is all about. You want something, it arrives at your door most of the time the next day. You need it now. In the Middle East, and certainly in Iran, one of the most prized virtues is patience. If any of you have been in the Middle Eastern marketplace, and Iran is the quintessential, um, it's tired in a market of what a real marketplace is. You know, you get off your tourist bus, you have five minutes. Oh, I really want this. I really want this. You go crazy. What happens to the price? The guy who's selling it goes up. On the other hand, if I've got time on my hand, well, you know, I can come back, I can have tea, I walk out. What happens to the price goes down. So we are in our obsession now with a deadline for these talks with Iran. Oh, we have to have it by a certain day. Oh, I want to make sure that I get it on my watch. On the agreement. What happens? The, what do the Iranians do to the price? And so here is proof. You and it, it, yes, enough yesterday. It was Friday. Our illustrious president and his staff give in, they have decided there is a civilian and a, nuke, and in a military uh, uh, nuclear program in Iran. Well, I'm not a nuclear expert, but I do know something about how the Iranian government works. Does anybody in this room believe that there is a difference between the military and the civilian programs and uh, uh, for nuclear for, to no. get, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Why then did we do this? Why did we say, oh, we're now taking off the sanctions in uh, from the civilian usage, but not for the military? Why? Because we really want this agreement. And what was the Iranians' reaction? Did, did that you know everybody? It's all over the news that there were, that the, we gave in on the so-called civilian program. What was the Iranian reaction? That's not enough. Up the price. Up the price. Yes, it's really simple. It's not rocket science. And our people, and believe me. Uh, in the back, uh, Andrea brought in, there are copies of this study, which I know they sent out the link to, um, the sources of Iranian negotiating behavior. If you, if you haven't read it, if you didn't on the link, maybe you want to take it in the back. The reason I'm, I'm saying is it's fun reading. What I mean is it's fun and it's sad because it explains how we are being had. And um, when the United States, for example, in the past has decided it doesn't want to, uh, uh, um, to pay the consequences of something that goes against it, it finds all sorts of convoluted logic to rationalize bad behavior. What do I mean? Do you remember, okay, everybody knows what Hezbollah is. Hezbollah oh, had, uh, remember how it, uh, it basically attacked the, uh, the marine back barracks in Beirut and uh, killed 283 Americans? Well, um, we didn't want to declare it an, an enemy. And it's, that was when Reagan was in power. And I'm a huge fan of Reagan, I want to say, but that doesn't mean everything that, that he did, I, I would agree with, but I remember when this happened. And so they put, they, 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 they basically ran. In the Middle East, when you run, there is no such thing as goodwill or, or come let us reason together or compromise. If I see that you're weak and giving in, what do I do? Boom, take advantage, up the ante. When do you negotiate in the Middle East? Negotiations are talks after you win, where the winner basically imposes his will 
I'm a loser. You're supposed to have some form of magnanimity and because you're, you're yeah, but it, that's the way it works. And the, there are no such thing as confidence building measures. That's called weakness. That's called giving in. Uh, goodwill measures are nuts. That's what we do. That's the way we negotiate because here in the United States, yeah, you're trying to negotiate. You don't defeat someone and, and then negotiate. You sit down and talk. And I give a little, you give a little, we shake hands. We have an agreement. In the Middle East, if you give in, you're weak. They go after you. And you lose. That is why we are losing, choosing to lose. This study was based on something that I did many, many years ago. And... Um, Believe me, it's available in a very different form, in a classified form. This is anything but classified. It's all stories of my experiences in Iran. Um, and that I did long before I worked for the Pentagon. They have access to this. Do you know, when I brought this to a, a nice Jewish man that, that you would recognize his name, I will not say, uh, I brought this when the Obama administration, uh, administration came into power. I brought it to his new office. Um, and it ends up that I knew his secretary very well. I didn't know this. And um, I, when she came out to take this from me, I said, do me a favor, tell me, you know, put it on his desk and then tell me what he does with it. Because he asked for it because I, I saw him at a, a gathering the night before. I said, I have this, since you are gonna be in charge of Iranian things, would you like this? I said, it's not political. And this is not political, this study. Anyway, so I come, the secretary comes out, we recognize each other, we hug each other. And I said, do me a favor, tell me what he does with this. And she goes like this, oh yeah. It's like, she takes this, puts it on his desk. About an hour and a half later, she calls me. She says, Harold, I put it on his desk. He was out. I came back. Then I noticed when I came back in, it wasn't on his desk. It was what is called in the burn bag. It's the burn bag is where you put classified information because again, I said there's a different version of this that, that I had done long ago. Um, and this person was in charge of Iranian thing. And he could have known. This is fun reading. There's no politics. It's not pro-Democrat. It's not pro-Republican. Hello. That's the way it is. Hello. Yes, question. No. Okay. What, 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 you were... Yes. You were with the government for 28 years. Yes. They did not fire you in the first year. They didn't fire you in the 10th year. So they must have thought that you had Wait, some... Sorry, the, the test for good... 28 years, you're trying to... Uh, Thank you. Treat Thank you very much. ...of reality, and nobody listens, and they still kept you on. I have two answers. After your first year in government, you get tenure, um, and it's harder to throw you out. But that's not the answer. The answer is there are some very senior people who recognize the value of what I'm, uh, what I, you know, what I have done, the life that I lived, and they wanted the information, and they didn't trust their own bureaucracy, they, the the bureaucracy, and so they asked me to write on these things. How do you think the bureaucracy felt towards me? Mad. They hated me. I, I just read the uh, uh, Google me, and you will see that from the time that I worked in government, uh, I, I can tell by some of the phrases who was saying it's all, you know, um, sources say. Um, I was accused uh, by, by many people of being a Mossad agent. If I am, I don't know about it, and I, you know, but that, you know, if I ever was. 
I know, but see, that's that's the when do you start beating your wife question? There's no answer to it. Norman, there were the point is it was number one hard to kick me out. And they there are very way there are many ways of doing it, which is launching major security investigations against you, which I had to endure. Believe me, what you saw, what they did with Trump was uh, uh, on a much grander scale. I mean, I'm a little nothing. I was a dumb little bureaucrat. But there are those who understood and did their damnedest to try to work on it, even in senior levels. So here's the problem. Many times in bureaucracies, leaders want to do something, but the bureaucracies undermine them. That's frankly what we're, what we're up against. Yeah. Obviously, you must have brought them through. So they just didn't believe them? Uh, I did bring them. No, please. Let me, uh, here, here's a way, it's, it's a, a little story I wanted to tell at the very end, but I'll, I'll simply tell it now. Many years ago, I was in my mid-20s, gave a lecture at a kibbutz that I had spent summers on um, in Israel on how the, Palest how the Muslims are talking among themselves, the Muslim Arabs, in um, Judea and Samaria uh, and in, within Israel. How do they talk among themselves about Israel? No, so, this was a leftist kibbutz. <clears throat> and again, the woman came up to me and said to me, beautiful Fletcher, you convinced me, but I will not accept what you're saying. Now, why? She said, if I accept what you're saying, I have to change my whole approach to understanding the Israel Arabs, uh, con whatever conflict, and I'm not prepared to do that. So I smiled and said, "Thank you very much. It's a huge compliment in the end to me, but it's dangerous for Israel." Well, I mean, she, I mean obviously, what I said, proof is proof, but I don't like what you're saying. And then you have what Kamala Harris invariably said: "To there's your truth, and there's somebody else's truth." No. The truth is that the, this is a piece of paper, isn't it? Truth, you know, facts are facts. And that is, in fact, the problem. Now, please, I want to give you, again, I'm supposed to, I mean, I can talk about this stuff forever. Let me go, let me really try to go back to Iran. And as my wife always reminds me, and she's absolutely 100% right, I am... I've never really studied Talmud. I know a lot more about Sharia than I do about Talmud. Sharia is nothing more than holy path in Islam. And I always go on tangents. Uh, so it, it looks like I, you know, maybe a page of Talmud, but I'm not. I, I really don't know Talmud. Let me talk about Iran, Iranian culture, and the greatness of Iranian culture. Um, and again, since we're, we're in a shul, um, you remember that we were um, uh, in 586 BC, we, our leadership was forced to go to Bavel, to Babylonia. And about 50 years later, we were by the Persians who took over Babylon. We were allowed to go back. Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, is called Hamashiach in the book of Yeshayahu, in the book of Isaiah. It's not a bunch of crazies. The rulers are a Islam started, which is the, uh, the, the, by that time, Iran had been an empire for 1,100 years. It had tremendous confidence in itself. Its views of the Arabs and its views of the of Arabs today, I'm just translating from the Persian, they are desert rats, lizard eaters, and a beautiful phrase used in Persian, cultureless, without culture, uncouth. That's how they viewed these nomads. Iran is a brilliant civilization. By that time, 1,100 years of greatness. And these nomads coming out of this, who the hell are they? Primitive, 
backwards. You hear what I say? They conquer all of the Middle East. And within 100 years, they're already in Spain coming out of the Arabian Desert. And they're in India or parts of what is, you know, Western India or what was the Indian subcontinent. It's Pakistan of today. That's a hell of a big place, and that includes the Persian. If you take what is today what you call the Arab world, within a hundred years, the languages of the basically the Aramaic was the, the lingua franca, the major language, was all obliterated. The culture was basically obliterated. They were Arabized, they became culturally Arab. Saadia Gaon writes in, it was at 970, he's writing his works in Arabic all the time before we were writing in Aramaic. Aramaic culture was devastated and replaced by Arabic. What happened in Iran? The civilization taken over. One of the great civilizations of the world taken over by the rodent eater eaters, the, the desert rats, these, you know, uncouth people from the desert <clears throat> for 300 years. Iranian culture goes underground. It doesn't disappear. What little we have from that time period is in Arabic, not, but it's not much. And then Persian, the Persian culture and Persian language reemerges. They have an enormous sense of who and what they are their greatness. In Islam, there was a concept called jahiliya. Jahil in Arabic means an ignoramus. Jahiliya is the period before Islam, which is in this, from an Islamic point of view, it is uh, everything pre-Islamic. It's of no concern to them. It's useless, it's dumb. But Iran doesn't have that concept of period of ignorance because the period before Islam they were a great civilization and it is in their bones it is in their bodies it is in their souls and remember we don't have a big a big problem with the Iranians do we back when they were the ones who allowed Nehemiah to go back Nehemiah was a, the prophet Nehemiah in English um, I don't know any of this Jewish stuff in, in, in English you'll excuse me Okay, Nehemiah is a government official, a senior government official in the Iranian establishment. He goes back and he, at the behest of Cyrus the Great, and if you look at Iranian Jewish history, maybe Cyrus is in fact a Jew. I don't, and I, I, if, when Purim comes, just you know one thing, at the, at the JTS, Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, they have an Iranian Agada. And he's married, excuse me, I, I have that wrong. It's right, it was a ruler beforehand. I forget who it was. He marries Queen Esther. And there is a very graphic picture of their son being born, and that's Iris. No, I'm not saying it's true, but I'm saying is it's in the Haggadah, the Iranian Haggadah that the JTS has. I remember it. I remember it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, please remember this. Iranians are survivors. 1,100 years, we are a something and taking over by these nomads, and they they become Muslims. But they tell the Muslims. Listen, we have this advanced way. We know how to rule the world. We can make you rich. You, of course, you're the rulers. But do it our way, because we know what we're doing. You have no traditions of how to rule. We are desert. They don't, they were upset. Iranians are enormously polite. They don't ever say something like, uh, 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 you know, to your face, unless there's a, unless the conversation has really, really gone down. The survivors, but this battle between Islam, which is understood as this desert nomad culture, and Iran, it's oil and water. You can mix them together all you want. 
What happens? You can do it for a thousand years. You're mixing and mixing and mixing. Sorry? Yeah, of course it is. And I, I remember in my time that I studied in this very religious city, a place called Mashhad. If you know Jews, if anybody's from Mashadi Jews. Yeah, well, I, I, that's where I... Uh, it's the way you look. Damascus Jews won't marry Aleppo Jews and vice versa. But that's changing. Because we're becoming what we really always were, one people. We're just, there's a melding going on, which is just awesome. And we are older. But the young generation, I mean, my father, who, my father couldn't read Hebrew letters when he died. I mean, that's, we, I come from a very, very secular background. Not anti-Jewish, but being Jewish was secondary. Um, he had a cartoon under the glass of his desk Litva, give blood to Galiziana. <laughs> no, no, younger people today, do they even know what those terms are? You know what a Litvak yeshiva is? Litvaks, which I am a pure Litvak of Sicilian origin. <laughs> I'm very serious, the DNA proves it. Um, uh, uh, we're, the, we're the brains, but the, the money, the people know how to make money are the Galizianers. So we need marriages between the two, so we can get a little of each. But I thought yeah. Rainbow Singer did not live in marriages. Um, in, in a chapel far away, about 15 years ago. Okay. They would not make children with the other. Mashari, Mashari, oh, Mashari. that's true. Mashari is like this. But then you, what, what we're learning DNA-wise is, uh, is really how we're all, the, there's one city, Iran is a really a, a a huge desert uh, in the center with a bunch of oases. And there is a city called Koshan. There are Koshan rugs. Um, uh, the Koshis, the people from there, have a tradition that they're from Spain originally. And they're part of the Spanish, you know. And you know what? The DNA shows that a lot of them are. It's, it's unbelievable. We're one people. We've been everywhere. A lot of Aleppo Jews who think that they're really special. So many of them are Mashinazi. The DNA shows it. So, okay, anyway, I really should go back to Iran because really that's what this is supposed to be about. I've had people in Iran tell me, I hate Islam. They forced us to be Muslims. Um, um, but we took over Islam and Persianized it. Shiism, what Iranians did when they protected, developed this protection, how to protect their culture after the advent of Islam, is that they built layers upon layers upon layers of, of protection around the court to protect whatever their court. There are so many layers that half the time they don't even know what the core is all about. Would it surprise you, you won't, uh, that? What is the, one of the most favorite foods in Iran? What reminds you of a core with layers and layers and layers? Who said? Onion. Iran, what the Iranians love, they love onions, cut sliced onions with sumac, which is this purple spice city. Yeah, they look, but they are, that, that, that symbolizes what the Iranians are. They are protecting their culture all the time. As I said, roll over as they held, oh, roll over as, just do it our way. Become culturally Persian and we will accept you. And excuse me, and you, you know, you, you, you know, we'll teach you, they wrote books on how to rule in Arabic so that the, the Arabs could read them. And um, very subtly, I bring you in and they develop all sorts of ways of being. They're the most polite and sweet people that you could imagine. Why are they doing it? Because they're first. I'm afraid of what you are going to do to me. And so I'm nice to you. I'm sweet to you. I, I'm really what I'm trying to do is protect myself. That leads to some interesting things. And it would be very nice if our government would understand this. We have, we understand their truth and there is lies. But the Iranians, especially the Shiites, Iranians mostly are Shiite, uh, have another thing. There's truth, there's lies, 
And there is taqiyah. Taqiyah is the Arabic word which means we don't really have a concept in English. I will tell you anything that I think you need to hear so you will either like me, not hurt me, and I'll look you right in the face. In American, if you uh, are, if you're lying to somebody, you'll see the our fish are we have to look our way or, because it's it's not right in our culture. But in Iran, I can look you right in the face, sit across and be as kind and as sweet and offer you all sorts of things. And I look you right in the face and you would never know. That's the third thing. And I want to tell you that so much of Iranian culture is based on that. It's not that they're bad people here. It's they're trying to protect themselves. I'm afraid of what you're going to do to me. And this is really who and what they are. No, no. we um, say to ourselves, um, oh, what's public opinion all about? And America is obsessed with public opinion polls. In a culture that I just described, how would you figure it out? I'm going to tell you some stories that happened to me. And you will realize you have no idea what's going on right in front of your face. Not only you don't, but the Iranians don't in their own lives. An example. I had learned a ton about Shiism before read a lot of books, took courses on this, before I went to Iran. I went to Iran I said, the first time uh, during Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur in 1977, then came back later to study. Um, I uh, knew that in, uh, in Shiite Islam, that there, you heard the word ayatollahs. Ayatollahs are, are, is only a Shiite thing. No, a yud and a vav, to Hebrew and Arabic, it's an Arabic word, even though it's used, as you'll see in, in, in Persian. Yud and vav are constantly changing back and forth. We have the word yelid in Hebrew for boy. Nolad was born. The, the yud turns into a vav. Um, valad in Hebrew, is uh, uh, a, is an early fetus. Um, valad, you see, the v is really a w. We Ashkenazim uh, perverted this. We couldn't be, we lost the ability to say what, and so it's now v. And that's how Hebrew has a vav and not a wow. That's in Arabic. It's Arabic still has it, yes. Semitic languages, um, the word for an and pretty much of everything is way, and it is in Hebrew. And if anybody is unfortunate enough to stand near me when I daven, I, I daven that way. Because we know how Hebrew was pronounced pretty much with the exception of one letter 2,000 years ago. And I'm just trying to recreate it because I'm a bit crazy. Anybody who'd be interested in this stuff is crazy. It's, I hope it's good crazy, though. Anyway, here's a story. Now, it illustrates the truth versus the false versus what else is going on. I knew that every Shiite family, and you're, I am Harold of Road. I'm not Harold. You, you don't, you know, you could know me for a long period of time and not know who my parents were, whether I have any siblings. Um, you, you wouldn't know if I had kids. You wouldn't know anything. But we can do that. That's the way we talk. How many guys talk with each other and go home and the wife said, well, how's the wife of this and the other? And you never mention, and our guys don't mention the conversation, their family by and large. They talk about whatever it is, politics. Some talk about golf or much that women talk much more, you know, about. And my wife will say to me, you mean you spent two hours on the phone with X and you didn't, you, you, you didn't ask about? No, I didn't ask. If it's someone whom she knows very well because she'll know the wife and whatever. It's the way it is. Now, I want to apply this to a story. Listen to the story. Every Shiite, every a Shiite is supposed to have an extended family. You belong to, I'm Harold of Road. The Harold part's less important. The Road part is much more important. That's my sub tribe or clan or something like that. Every clan, every extended family is supposed to have a grand ayatollah. And my, by the way, Yelid and Valad that I watch this, 
Oth in Hebrew, Aleph, Vav, Taf, means a sign. Aya Torah, Aya is Oth. It is a sign from Allah. And I will say when I'm talking about the Muslim, the, 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 the supreme being from a Muslim point of view, I will call him Allah. I will not call him God and I will not call him Hashem. Why? Because we think of the word God with it from a Jewish point of view and the, the, the characteristics maybe that we attribute to God or our God are very different from those of, of the Muslim God. So that's why I call him Allah because I want in trying to differentiate in my mindset, that they believe in, a, in in one God. There's no question about it. They're absolute monotheists, but his characteristics are different from ours. That I may do whatever in, in my last little talk that I'm going to do here. Now here, watch the story, what I'm going to say. Every grand, I said every family is supposed to have a grand ayatollah that they look to for advice, support, uh, uh, to get a sakdin, uh, a halachic answer to a, or sharia answer to a question, then there are, the number varies. A grand ayatollah is the equivalent of like a triple or quadruple PhD. Um, that's, it's unbelievable how smart they are. And by the way, they have a lot more in common. Uh, they, and they, they use reasoning. Shiites, the Sunnis, the gates of independent reasoning were closed in the 10th century. And all they have left is the Hebrew word hekesh, which means genealogy, and qiyas in Arabic. You can hear k and sir are the same. Hekesh, the he in the beginning is, 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 is k, y, sh, hekesh, in, in better Hebrew, and qiyas in Arabic. Same word, analogy. All they have the Sunnis left is analogy to go back and look how was it done beforehand, and that's what we do. How do you deal with modern technology and all that? Big problem. For them, the Ayatollahs want reasoning, they want to think. But here's the story now. I, simple, nice, sweet Harold, the American, 28 years old, I'm in university with these Iranian, my fellow students, and I'm asking a simple question Who is the grand Ayatollah that your family follows? It's a fair question. I read about it in books galore. I ever went to Iran. Now I'm going to take a bunch of the stuff I said, it's all going to come together. And they would look at me with sweet faces and as if they have no idea what I'm talking about. And I'm like, what's going on here? It's the equivalent of saying to a Christian, um, have you ever heard of Jesus? And the answer is uh, never heard of him. Not possible. Yeah. I, uh, okay. Unfortunately, there are Jews who are not too sure who Moshe Rabbeinu was, and which is why I did not use a Jewish analogy to that. Anyway, so I'm asking all my Iranian friends, and they're looking at me straight in the face, and as if they don't know what I'm talking about. It's like, you mean you're a Christian and don't know who Jesus is? It's like it made no sense to me. But I, I didn't understand. And I knew the names at that time of six. I'm going to tell the story. Then I'm going to analyze that our way and the Iranian way. And I knew the names of six grand ayatollahs at the time. And I began to mention to some of these after a while, it didn't make any sense to me what's going on. And they all looked. And I'm like, this is crazy. Something is wrong. Is everything I read about Shiites? And she isn't totally wrong. I don't think so. I read some damn good scholars on this and Iranians on this. What happens? The university, life becomes difficult. There are riots. That's why the revolution is not a day. I mean, all sorts of bad things are happening. And people are, are yelling things like, at first, death to the Shah. And I'm like, you know. What I didn't realize, and that's what a revolution is really, it's chaos. There are no rules, there are no laws. Real trouble was gonna happen. And it's going back and forth and all that. And my fellow students who are looking at me in the face, 
uh, and all that were so sweet things that they don't know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, some of them are out in the streets in riots yelling, death to the Shah, long live Khomeini. You guys remember the name Khomeini? Yeah, the Grand Ayatollah who led the Iranian revolution. And I'm listening to this. I, I was watching. I was not in the demonstrations, God forbid. I'm watching this, and I'm furious, American view. They lied to me. We don't like it when people lie to me, or when, we, when, when we're lied to. In fact, you know, it, it's a truth is a very, very important commodity, or at least it used to be in this country. So what happens? I go back to the dorms, knock on my door. About five, six guys come in. They shut the door behind them and very quietly, it's just like they're about to tell some big secret. And these were guys out in the riots. And they're saying, they close the door and one of them says, anybody know French here? Basic French, very basic. You. They were saying to because the Persian in this case is backwards from, from French and it's exact. Khomeini Kie. Who is Khomeini? Now I'm totally confused. What's going on here? Why also why are they coming to me? They're yelling, death to the show along with Khomeini and asking me who Khomeini is. Something is clearly very different from what it appears. Here's the story. Remember how they looked at me and smiled and had they had no idea who the Grand Ayatollahs were? They were protecting themselves. Maybe I'm a spy for the Shah. And most of the Grand Ayatollahs and the Shah did not get along. And so why are they going to tell me, someone who lands from Mars, if you wish, whom they have no trust in, they don't know anything about, why are they going to tell me the answer to my question, who's grand, which grand ayatollah does your family follow? Because if they answered, maybe I was going to report them to the police. Now, that's their logic. Now, this all sounds crazy to us, but it's not. It gets better. Why are they asking me about Khomeini? Because I told you that I mentioned six names, and one of them was Khomeini that I didn't know much about, but I knew the name. They remembered that I was saying that I mentioned the name. And the, they had no idea. They're out yelling, long live Khomeini. They figured, why are they doing that? Because they saw power shifting from the Shah to Khomeini. And in Iran, you must end up on the side of the winner or else you may die. So they were curious about Khomeini that they've just been demonstrating for, that they have a very fine sense of how things are changing. And we, um, and they came to me because they remembered I mentioned his name. You see, the story has completely different interpretation on how you look at it. Then I realized I wasn't angry at them anymore. Something else was going on. And they have a very, very, so were they pro Khomeini? They had no idea who he was. How can you be pro Khomeini if you don't know who he is? But they saw that he was powerful. And he was, his power was shifting to him. And let me bend over and let me, and if you wish, submit to you. And we want to know what the Iranian people think. What they want to know is going to hurt them. And they will lie, cheat, and whatever. And bring you in to get what they want. Uh, the... Uh, uh, give you, uh, again, Persian culture versus our culture. I'm in the marketplace in 1977. I'm a pauper student. Uh, I don't know much uh, about, my Persian is very, in 1977, uh, is the Hebrew word. It's like, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm like, I don't really know the language well. I know Arabic and I know Turkish, and I'm putting it together to invent. I said the most unbelievable things, but I have no shame. I'm, I'm like a little kid learning a language to make mistakes. Uh, when you get older, I suppose you're not, but maybe I'm still a kid. Anyway, um, uh, uh, no shame. 
I've lost where I was going with this. Oh, yes, thank you. I, I don't have much money. I want to buy a brooch from my mother. I, I married a bunch of years later. And uh, the guy says to me, um, the, the store, whatever thing, and, and I know the idea of patience, but something else was plain was going to happen to him. He said, this is 80 toman. toman there were 7.2 tomans to the dollar at that time. So, so that was 72 is $10. That's about 11, 12, whatever dollars. That was a lot of money for me. And he can see I'm hesitating. The conversation is in Persian. Now, the largest group of people in Iran aren't Persians. They're Azerbaijanis, Azeris. And a lot of them are nothing more than Persianized because since it's the superior culture and Turks are nomads, Azerbaijanis are Turks. They have been assimilated into Iranian culture. That's what the Chinese do, exactly the same thing. The Mongols took them over and within a generation, they, they were, uh, uh, they, they ruled as China culturally. Oh, rule us, no problem, just do it our way. China and Iran, very, very similar, historically. Anyway, <laughs> and he, the guy says to me, I only paid 75 for this. I'm only making five to a month. And I, he can see I'm looking. He said, I'll prove it to you. He looks at his, the, the next stall the guy who was out there, and he says to him, in supposedly Persian, he says, Mr. Remember he said he 75? That's what he said, he's only making five to mine. That sounds fair. He says to the neighbor, Mr., and he gives him a name. He says the exact words, well, yet mishbash. And I knew Turkish much better than I did Persian, Azerbaijani is Turkish. Yetmish means 70, Besh means five. Shesh Besh, you know the game? Shesh is six, Besh is five. That's how you go from one end of the board to the other. And by the way, if you watch any Muslims playing it, they use Persian numbers for in, in playing the dice and all that, and in playing Shesh Besh. Anyway, I hear this. He says, Mr. Yetmish Besh, how much did this cost me? I'm not furious because I'm being lied to. But it was very normal in Iran. The he says people were negotiating with. You think we know what's going on? It's much worse than I'm and than I'm even saying. I who know Turkish better start speak answering them, them both in Turkish, saying, Oh, what an interesting thing. Your name is. 75, just like the amount that you said that you wanted of the, that, how you paid for this. Well, and of course, as a nice American, I'm furious. I'm being lied to. This is normal culture. And these are the guys we're negotiating with. And we have nobody on our team who understands this. Nobody. I'll give you their backgrounds a little later. Unfortunately, many of them are Jews, most Jews maybe. No, no, the, our team under Obama and now under um, Biden that are negotiating. No, Blinken just the, the, I'm talking the actual negotiators, the people in charge of Iran, the Jews. What? Wendy Sherman. Wendy Sherman. Yeah, absolutely. The, his number two and um, uh, a guy named Robert Malley. Um, he's from both sides. He's Jewish. Um, his father was an Egyptian communist who hated everything Jewish. Oh, really? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, Rob Malley. Rob Malley's mother, um, her name was Silverberg. And guess what she did? You remember there was something called the FLN, the Algerian Liberation Front? She fought with the Algerian Liberation Front against the French. And this is the background that he comes from. And he's the one in charge of Iranian stuff. What about Sherman? Wendy Sherman? Sherman is a nice lit fuck name. I know it sounds English. Um, 
I am from a place where we lived in, in Washington, a place called Potomac, Maryland, outside of Washington. And um, if I'm correct, she, uh, <clears throat> I heard she used to be a social worker in the little town next to where we were. Um, but she was close with Obama. I mean, again, uh, it's a post with everything. But look, this is what we're dealing with. What now, happened with the brooch? What happened with the brooch? Okay, I have to finish. thank you, I need that. And I, I, I haven't really even gotten even to the material I want, but Rabbi Green is saying whatever, and he, he, he's right. That's my problem. What happened with the brooch? Here's a very simple thing. When I started speaking Turkish, they were a little embarrassed. What do you think? What are they, so what do they say? Another problem with Iran, Nico, you just see him. So he says to me, Pishkesh in Persian. Pishkesh means it's yours. It's a gift. <laughs> No, in Iran, when they say it, they, you never admire someone in an Iranian's house. It's something, oh, I really like uh, your box of masks here. Norman, your first response is it's yours. Yeah, they don't mean it. But that's, uh, but they, oh, it's I who said to myself, oh, well, you know what? Fine, thank you very much. And I take it and walk away. One of the guards then comes up to me and starts saying to me, um, you know, you didn't pay for this. I said, he gave it to me as a gift. He said, Pish gave. Now, he understood very well in that culture what, what the story is. I said, I'm an American, and when you say that, you give something, you say thank you, and you walk away, which is what I did. Now, you remember all these death to America when the hostage crisis rallies were taking place, and they were all yelling death to America? If there was a rumor, and there was at one point, that around the corner in front of the American embassy, they were handing out American visas. Because <laughs> someone had stole one of the visa machines. Um, and you know, you want to know what the Yankee go home mean? Yankee go home and take me with you, please. <laughs> we don't, I'm just, I won't. I'll, I'll end this here. I, guys, I'm happy to continue this. Uh, but I was going to do in the Iraqi whatever thing next. Whatever. Um, these, when I graduated from the Pentagon, I retired, which is at age 60, which is 12 years ago. Why did I retire? I think it was you who asked the, the question before. Maybe it was you, Norman. Um, uh, when they can't defeat you intellectually, what do people often do? Oh, no, uh, I, there was no way. I, I didn't want to be promoted. I had to be responsible for people, which is the worst thing. I could. No, what they do is they badmouth you. A common attacks. They attack you personally. He's a Mossad agent. He's a this. He's a that, which is what they did so much during the 28 years of work at the Pentagon. I couldn't take anymore. When I left the Pentagon, when I left, and it was, I, I worked, also, I did a lot of things in a little place, like I was on, sometimes the, during the week, it was more at the White House than I was at the Pentagon. But here's what happened. Imagine, and now you'll know who, 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 our, who our team is, our negotiating team is. Imagine that um, uh, when I left, I was the youngest person who had ever lived in Iran in the United States government, to my knowledge, that is, that's a big place, in the, in the political section, and I know less about the intelligence section, but everybody they had met, they had no experience in Iran. May I ask you a question? If is it, there is nothing, nothing that is, that is better than actual experience on the ground. And you had, you had Iranians who, and maybe a different view, but I'm the was the youngest American who had lived in Iran, lived with Iranians, lived in the culture, went to mosque with them, davened with them, ate with them. I didn't eat kosher at the time. And now it's 12 years later. And still we have nobody who lived in American who lived in Iran and all of that. They have no the people doing the negotiations have no concept whom they are dealing with, which is why we had situations like John Kerry, who 
when Zarif, the foreign minister, who was his opposite, he negotiated the 2015 deal. At one point, what is, what is, Zarif is so polite, they know how to use our culture against us, but we don't know how to use their culture against them. Carrie is crying at one point. Um, he was so emotional. This was our Secretary of State, who, and the more we gave in, there were cartoons in the newspapers, and I'll, I'll, I'll just end with this, and these are the people who show how little we understand at our peril. Carrie broke his leg during the negotiations, and he was getting going around on crutches. In the Middle East, if you have any type of, for, uh, of what? Infirmity or something permanent. <laughs> Deformity is even better. Yeah, they, they, they make fun of you. There's no such thing as compassion. And so all the cartoons in the Iranian newspapers about Carrie emphasized his crutches. And the more we gave in, who was our president at the time? Mr. Obama. The more we gave in, the more they emphasized his Negroid features in cartoons, and in the Middle East, black skin is inferior. And oh, when it goes over, oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter because they are taking us. What, what is it? They're, they're, they're taking advantage of us, and we are letting it happen. And that is, in essence, our problem. And now the only one who could do anything about it, it seems, since we are obviously in the process, we've been for giving in for God knows how long. Um, the only one who's left alone to deal with this is a little tiny state, which is one of the most sophisticated in the world. Yeah, that's the way it is. Yes, ma'am. Excellent question, and here's why. Here's why it is. Do you remember? In the, and I'll answer questions out of five because they need to use the room now, don't they? Um, uh, here's the answer. Do you remember in 2009 there was this gorgeous woman named Neda Sultan who was a riot in Tehran, and this beautiful girl was killed? Her so-called fiance, don't be with that word, me, escapes, goes to Rome, and ends up in Jerusalem for, for talks. I think it was in Kenya. I was at a luncheon with this is 2009. And I'm at this luncheon, and I'm saying to myself, so much I'm not getting here now. It's not just the language, but their cultural changes. Minute, but they have significant meaning. And I asked some of the Israelis who were there, who live and read Iran, um, uh, who know very well what's going on. I said, there's so many things I missed there. I, I, do, I, well, uh, do, do, are you aware of these changes? Can you factor them in? We can't hear you. And that's it. You know, Thank you. I was going to say, I'm a Palestinian. I mean, we have a word that says, I was growing up in a better door always open. And this is the way we see around the same porch, the same dog. We can be as polite, as nice, and as deadly as they. It's not a problem. They're not going to take something. Dr. Rode, I have a question for Dr. Rode. Oh, Mike, I'll call you, okay? Uh, yeah, I have a question for you to answer for everybody. But the point is they need the room now because there's uh, another webinar going. Mike, I'll call you on my uh, driving home, okay? Okay, bye. <laughs> I have no Quite idea. Few, few. It says, no, it, it's going down now. It, it was 11, 12, but I didn't see. I have. I didn't look at that. Set. A Jewish time. I'm not allowed to do this. What are you My wife. That? I can't. I. I. I don't. 
I'm not allowed. It's not that you're a woman. It's just that my wife says I can be Japanese. I didn't recognize with the mask. You brought your boyfriend. Oh, he's, he's a jealous boyfriend. I want to shut it off. I want to shut it off, please. Do you guys want to ride home? I'm going to my car. Ah. Uh.